Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Our Beloved Gurudeva, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Beloved disciples of Yogananda, we bow before all of you. Be with us this evening. Help us to attune ourselves to your divine presence and to allow your energy to fill this room, to flow through each of us, helping us to feel closer to God and Guru. Om. Peace. Amen. Well, I'm going to blame Ramorti for making me do two saints tonight. <laughs> Was it your idea or my idea? I won't say. Yeah. <laughs> um, Last week when I left here, I decided that it was, of course, virtually impossible to talk about these two great souls in one short night. Um, I feel this every year when I do the saints class, no matter what saint I go to talk about. So I said, no, I'm not really going to talk about Sister Gyanamata. But um, mm, I got drawn in because Rajasi's life and her life were in some ways so intertwined. And then as soon as you start reading at all about her, uh, you know, it just becomes impossible to not want to share about her. She's just such a beautiful soul. So let's see what happens. I could never quite come up with the rhyme or reason or way. I figured they better help me through this. I was looking to see what about Sister Gyanamata was known outside of, if anything, outside of SRF. So I was looking for her on the internet, and lo and behold, I came across a um, webinar that um, Dharma Raj and Dharmini did some years ago uh, on YouTube. So I watched the first class. It was, it was actually quite fabulous, but the first thing that Dharmini, I, the first thing she said, and she said it, many times throughout that first class. I never found the other classes, so I've written to them and asked them to send me links. They disappeared somehow, but uh, she kept saying, this is really a hard class to prepare for. <laughs> she kept saying, and I felt so empathic um, because, and this is of course true, no matter what saints we're talking about, but there's no fat with these saints. Whatever they write, whatever words they speak, I mean, literally, other than a few prepositions that are in a sentence, you just, every word that they say is just rich with the Spirit of God. And the other thing that happened for me, and I share this just to kind of set the stage a little for us, is I had that experience first about Rajasi who I have really not known that much about. And um, I, I've read in the distant past both of these books, but really I say this a lot, but when I picked them up to read them this time, I just felt like I had never seen them before. And in fact, nothing was underlined in them, which is really interesting. So I must have skimmed through them at some time, but I didn't know him. And then you know that what happened with Swamiji when he picked up um, autobiography of a yogi where he saw it the first time in New York and he picked it up and he opened it and Master had dedicated it to Luther Burbank, an American saint. And he immediately closed the book saying, that's ridiculous. How could there be an American saint? Well, I have to say, I ran into that myself, not once I got absorbed in the books, but um, it, was, it was a challenge to me to choose to get to know something about Rajasi, but to be reading initially about this American man who looked like us, 
who really started his life creating all these big businesses, which we all know, and it was sort of like, where's the saint? And the other thing that happened is that before I finished Rajasi, a great Western yogi, this book that's published by SRF, which turns out this was me having huge control, uh, <laughs> is um, I picked up the trilogy book that uh, Durga Mata wrote. And um, how many of you have read that book? Okay, everybody's read it, or most people have. So, you know, Durga was a character, and uh, to say the least, and she was very outspoken, very direct. And she wasn't, I mean, at least in this book, and I actually had a long talk. I called Asha yesterday to ask Asha, I'd like to hear from you, what did Swamiji say about Rajasi? And what did Swamiji say about Durga? Because she just doesn't mince her words. She doesn't speak. You know, we can tend to be overly careful. We want to do what is right on the path. We want to not express opinions that are unflattering. We, many of us do. And so we just hold a lot of those first words that want to come pouring out. We hold them in. The thoughts don't go anywhere. Well, she had none of that. It's just not what she did. So she was describing him and she would tell a story like in this book, it's here for the whole world to read, so I can certainly say this, you know, that he was so used to getting the best of everything and what he wanted that he would, when fruit would come in or think, whatever, anything was delivered to en uh, Encinitas, he would take the best for himself first. She said he was just used to having the best. He felt like it was meant for him. And she said she knew him well enough to know that if she just said to him, you really shouldn't do that, it would either embarrass him or he would react negatively. So she would just work her way in and find the best piece of fruit and hold it up and say, oh, Master would so love this piece of beautiful fruit, or which she would say to him, oh, you of course know the custom in India, which is to give the best to the guru. And then he would, of course, want to behave that way, I mean, he, he beyond loved master, which is what we'll talk about tonight. This was no normal or usual love affair that went on, which is what really gets compelling at first reading is more what master said about Rajasi and how he reacted to him than anything you get to know about Rajasi. Um, that he, of course, wanted to do what was right. So then the next time fruit is a perfect example because he loved growing fruit and he uh, grew beautiful fruit and he would have crates of it sent so it would come. He would pick out the most beautiful and he would say, I think Master would love this. And then he would give it to Master and Master would come to Dorga and say, look at this, Rajasi gave me the best piece of fruit. <laughs> now very much to Dorga's credit, she never told Master. She said, I always had the, uh, the great joy then of pleasing my master, you know, because really that's how she saw it. It does become very clear as time goes on that she both knew who Rajasi was, but if for no other reason, just because of what a great saint she was, which I think she clearly was, um, I mean, even in master's words, she was, uh, that because her guru had asked her to serve Rajasi, she did it as if she was serving her guru in every moment. I mean, there was no difference for her, but she also saw exactly how master was with him. So I don't want to get stuck too much on his background because I think we know it, but just to set the stage a little bit, he was born in 1898. Uh, I think it was, and um, he was born to parents who seemed like they were lovely and very generous, deeply spiritual people. And he was the fifth child and it became his job to really serve with his mother. 
so which I think is interesting and was just perfect. So he spent a lot of his early years um, helping her cook, helping her do kind of good deeds in the neighborhood because that's the kind of woman she was and that's what was asked of him. Uh, his first job at age 14, he made $2 a month. And even given the times, um, because I remember my first job in 19, uh, God, what year was that? Sorry, now I'm blocking, 69. It must have been 1969. My first job as a nurse, I was paid $50 a month. So the times were, um, you know, spoke to that, but still $2 a month was a lot less. And that was some years before I went to work, but not all that much. But he came in at a time, you know, of course it was after the Industrial Revolution, but I mean, it wasn't that long after there was electricity in this country for the first time. When he was born, electricity was just coming. The trains were just being built. It was a time of enormous growth and materialism. And he moved on very quickly. That's the part that will pass by here um, to get to his sainthood, which is going to be of much more interest to us. But this is interesting because soon he had a job making $15 a month and then $65 a month. And in this most remarkable way, because he never graduated from high school. So when he applied to law school, he had to promise them that he would finish and get his high school degree. And interestingly, he passed the bar before he graduated from law school. It's just what he did. But they, he was such an extraordinary student and so, I think, really magnanimous must have been the word in every way. Brilliant, generous, just insightful, already doing such great business that I don't think anybody could imagine holding him back. At that time, there was a law that nobody could be given uh, an accounting license before the age of 25. Why there was that law, I don't know. But he had gone to, uh, gotten his degree in accounting and his law degree at the same time. And he was just ready to become an accountant and was offered one of the bigger jobs in the country. You know, he was involved with lumber and railroad companies and I mean, all of these businesses that he went into from a financial point of view initially. So here he was being offered literally one of the biggest jobs in the country at the age of 24. And they said, well, we better give you a license to be an accountant. It's just the way things happened for him. I mean, he was clearly a great soul. Just tonight I read somewhere, and I'll, I'll never be able to find it, so I'll paraphrase it, that he said, let me just think if this is true. No, I apologize. That was about Sister Gianamata. I was, but he was clearly on a spiritual search at an early age. He had a spiritual teacher before Master, but that teacher was over at his house one time, and his wife, and again, I won't talk much about her, who was really, you know, I don't think she's presented like she was always trying to undermine him. And I have no idea what the real story is, but I think she might have been psychiatrically disabled in a way that nobody could diagnose at the time. She really sounds like she might have had bipolar disease because she had these huge outbursts that were, I mean, big, and she would do them publicly, really out of control. It wasn't just a wife being mad at her husband or feeling a little jealous or a little challenged. Uh, as I read more and more about her, I thought maybe people just were not diagnosing her. But God bless him. I mean, he always took care of her. He avoided her and, her and did not set up scenes after the first couple where she could make these public outbursts again because he was very invested in doing his business well. I mean, that mattered a great deal to him. And, um, you know, I think later we get to see, as Master said over and over and over, you were meant to do business to serve God. You were giving this business to really help, which he did. I mean, it was through Rajasi that SRF was able to be established and be as successful as it was. And 
Master kept telling Durga, who used to always have to go to Rajasi, that was one of her jobs, is that Master never asked Rajasi for money. He always asked Durga to ask Rajasi for money. And he would say to her, tell him we, he's got to give a million dollars. He's got to give that to SRF. And Master said very, very uh, clearly, he did not mince his words. And Durga learned not to mince her words with Rajasi, although she said she always did it in a letter, that he was a man of such few words that he would never respond and she didn't want him to have to go through his questioning, his hesitancies, whatever it was that he was doing, but I don't think she ever figured out face to face. <clears throat> so she wrote him letters, even sometimes when they were both in Encinitas. She would write him a letter with these requests, which were huge. I mean, really, Master counted on him, not just to get SRF, stabilized and to leave it funded and to make sure that it could happen when they both left their bodies. But he sent Master to India. It was, he fully subsidized this trip. And you know, that trip was, of course it was for many reasons, Master really was being called back to see Sri Yukteswar before he left his body. Sri Yukteswar made it clear to Master that he would be leaving his body soon and wanted to see him and I think we know that. But that trip was very much about Master's desire to meet many of the saints and be in many of the situations that he put into the AY. He knew he needed to write this autobiography of a yogi, and he needed to go to India to do that. He wanted to make sure that stories he had heard were accurate and that everything he wrote in the AY was absolutely true. I mean, meeting St. Teresa, meeting many of the people that he met. So he appealed to Rajasi. So Rajasi was, abs and Rajasi's money was absolutely instrumental to Master's work in this world. And so there were reasons why he was uh, given the power and the ability to make as much money as he did. Again, when you think of not just one million dollars that he gave SRF, but millions of dollars, and what that would translate to nowadays. You can see um, how that was just literally divine providence. That's what that was. Um, what struck me more than anything in all of this reading that I want to share tonight, so we all know that the very first night that Master met Rajasi. Master gave him an experience of samadhi. You know, that just tells us so much about who this man was. Because in Master's own words, he would not give samadhi to many other people who begged him for it. When he would say to people, you are not ready for it. And what he meant by that what, when he would expound on it, is that they would not be able to sustain the experience. And he said to many people, you will not be able to sustain the experience. You, by your own power, will not be able to recreate that experience, and you will not be able to tolerate your life moving forward. This is what he said to others. So I'm not going to give you an experience that will just li have you live in torture. But that was not how he reacted to Rajasi. He, um, Rajasi, you know, went the first night to see him. Frida, his wife, had one of those outbursts. Um, so he didn't take her back. He went back alone. He went for three nights. Um, and I'm sorry, just let me back up. I just, it doesn't really matter except I want to be saying the truth. I think she went all three nights with him. She did. And then she became so jealous and so upset that he was going to get too much of Rajasi's attention. That, that is when she started uh, acting out. So I only want to, I just wanted to make that be accurate for this uh, recording. 
she did go with him. But he recognized him on the third night. He really saw who Master was. After that, very soon after that, Master sent his secretary to Rajasi's estate and asked him if he could have a private audience with him. Master asked Rajasi. Obviously recognized him right away. But what f was fascinating in reading, and I'll read some of these to you probably at random later because they're so beautifully written in letter after letter. But, but Master said to Durga and said to many people, I couldn't stay in my body if Rajasi left his body. I couldn't live on this earth without him. He told Rajasi so many times and in so many ways in all of these beautiful letters that he wrote to him from India during this trip. Um, even when Sri Yukteswar uh, rematerialized his body after he had left his body and came back to Master, the, one of the first things he said to Master is, tell this to Saint Lin as well. Tell Saint Lin that all of the masters are working for him on an, on, from this astral plane because it is through him that you are being able to do, that we are all being able to do the work that we want to do there. So every one of those masters recognized Saint Lin and kept saying even to Yogananda, tell him from us. Yogananda said something, and again, I know you've all read these words, but just not as recently as I have. Master told Rajasi that Lahiri Mahashaya was his astral guru, and that he was really his guru, but working through Sri Yukteswar on a material plane. So when Master was traveling through India, he was constantly having these visions these meetings with Lahiri Mahashaya and with Sri Yukteswar. And they were always giving him messages, both of them, for St. Lin. Even Babaji did. Babaji came to Master and in, a, in visions, I mean, what do visions mean? They came to him and would say to him, tell St. Lin, we want St. Lin to know that we understand the work that he's doing that none of this could be going on, not on the material plane, but that in a subtle way, which is so beautifully expressed through Master in these letters, that Master could not have done, that it was essential, of course, it was, they all knew ahead of time, I'm sure, but that Lin was here so that Master could come and do his work, not just that he was given the money and the ability on the material plane, but that spiritually, that Master could only work if Lin was there, that they, ha they were working together. And Master said, let me see if I can find some of these. Um, this is Master's, one of these, uh, this is a letter he was writing. He wrote Rajasi every single week, at least once, if not more, from India. And he wrote him these beautiful letters. I mean, that just said, I just weep at times, I miss you so much. He literally says these words over. Sometimes I don't know how I can go on without you being here with me. I mean, when you, when you really let that in, I mean, when you realize this is master, this is an avatar saying to one of his disciples, I couldn't live without you, he told Durga over and over. If he dies, because he was very worried, he kept saying Satan was trying to get to Rajasi. And he said, I, I have to leave my body before Rajasi does. If Rajasi leaves, I will consciously and thoughtfully exit my body. Their bond was so amazing. I mean, we read these stories of, watch, of all the, the uh, nuns say particularly, watching them just walk hand in hand you know, Master called him my little boy all the time, my little one. And it's so dear. I mean, so Rajasi would sign his letters back to Master, your little boy or your little one, or he would write dot, just a little dot, and then the number one. <laughs> it's so sweet. I mean, there was such, 
an absolute sweetness, but to them, there was a oneness. The first day they met, they meditated together for six hours. The first day, Rajasi, who behaves like he's just out in the world wanting to meet a teacher. Uh, the story I started to tell you before is that he had an, an, an Indian teacher before this, but one day Frida had one of these outbursts when, the, uh, when this Indian teacher came and it scared this guy and he wouldn't come back. So he lost that teacher, but of course he lost them because he was waiting for master. But it's hard to, I just felt so steeped in, there was absolutely no separation, even when they were out in the world functioning, that they were one. And Master frequently wrote, it's two in one, it, it, it's, it's two in one. Mean, not just meaning uh, any two in one, you know, but that we two have come together as one expression of the divine. He writes to him in one of his letters. He said, we will never have another life as Yogananda and Lynn. We have to do everything we can do now. This, this is the incarnation for us to make not just spiritual progress. They didn't really have any spiritual progress they needed to make. Master said that Rajasi attained Sabhikalpa Samadhi. He said it over and over, very early on in their meeting, but so that millions after us, we have to make sure that we do the work we need to do so that millions behind us can find God as we found God. He makes it just as clear as can be. That was, I had to just keep meditating into that and not try and think about it too hard because then I had to start explaining it to myself. Oh yeah, the way we always say, they're just telling these stories for our benefit. No, Master was really saying in the divine plan, in the div and he says it to him over and over. First, this is a beautiful letter. This is from Master to Rajasi. He said, it staggers one imagination and one is filled with the ecstasy of joy to, the re to recall the evening you walked like a child into the hall of my recognition in Kansas City. And he says, I had asked Divine Mother, he said, I'll tell you actually, I prayed for a saintly businessman who would act as a divine comrade to serve this work as his own work. And such joy, such mutual sincerity and happiness in doing God's work together Dreams about our divine communion often flit by my mind, he says, and I've caught one of those dreams of happiness and painted it in words as it comes straight from the chamber of my heart, he's saying in this letter. Yeah, it's so beautiful. He writes, actually, he just writes uh, so many love letters. He said, I have something sacred to tell you. I feel master, he's talking about Sri Yukteswar. Uh, is everywhere, and I have within something immortal as to how he came to me on the 19th of June and showed me his resurrected body. I cried aloud, we've read this in other places, is it my Lord the same body that was interred in the salt and soil at Puri? Tell, yes, it is so. I am alive, and Sri Yukteswar says, the very first words out of his mouth, tell this to St. Lynn. I have come away from a real dream world and have appeared really in your dream world. I was real then, I am real now. And Yogananda says to him, your name he uttered first. It's so beautiful. I just, th there's no other words for some of this than to really get, because when I asked Asha yesterday, what did Swamiji say about Rajasi? Because I don't remember him saying that much. And Asha said, he said he always wanted to have more time with him because he was just a man of so few words. When Master was alive, Rajasi rarely spoke. So it's really hard to tell 
stories directly about Rajasi. Rajasi tells a story that one time, Master said to him, you speak now. And Rajasi said, oh no, Master, you have so much more to say than me. He said then he was aghast because he realized that he had refused his guru, that his guru had just asked him to speak. He said, so I spoke for five minutes. But I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to play a, uh, a, just a five-minute recording of him. We have very little of anything he said, but just so we can hear his voice, which is a little shocking, I'm going to warn you, but, and, but absorb his vibration because he was so great. But his greatness, you know, Master died in 52 and he died in 55. And by 53, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor that ultimately rendered him speechless, which is just so interesting. But, um, so we don't get to hear him much. That's the point I'm trying to make. There's so little other than all of these pictures, every picture in these books. He's just sitting there in samadhi. Now, of course, that speaks volumes. But I mean, it's still, other than saying he was always in samadhi, I mean, if you're actually trying to give a class about the man, it's a little challenging. <laughs> but through Master, you know, we get to uh, hear and read so much. So I just want to grab a few of these. This is what, what he was writing. This is words of Yogananda about Rajasi. That's this whole section. But he said, the great ones choose able, willing devotees on earth to deliver other men from ignorance and suffering. On your human life, the immortals have put their invisible hands. Blessed you are beyond human dreams. Yes, God and the masters could employ miracles to create big temples, but that would not change souls. But when the great ones find a powerful human soul who makes an altar of his heart with goodness and good works, then they come there to dwell and to work goodness. I mean, he's just saying to him, you were absolutely chosen clearly because they needed to be able to work through you, to use you as, as an example. This is, and this is all master talking to Rajasi. He says, half of my spiritual realization is yours. You know, I mean, again, you can, this is what I think I did the first time I read the book. You, you just read that. But he's saying to Rajasi, everything I am, you are too. And not only that, we are two in one. I cannot work as I work in this incarnation without you. It's remarkable. I have given so much to none but you. <laughs> on your last day on earth, as you feel a sudden illumination, a doubling of all of your inner perceptions, an unexpected expansion, untold increase of light and bliss, then you will know what I have given you. I have given you this half of me that exists alongside of you. Together, we are one. He says, these are all very sacred things I am telling you, <laughs> like we might not know. You have served as one of the greatest instruments of all time. This is master. I mean, again, he means this. To bring east and west together. And I have made a place for you in heaven will you, where you will sit by me and Lahiri Mahashaya. Ever be diving deep and deeper unto eternity, never seeking the end, for ever new bliss is eternal. I just find these words so beautiful. I often see Master, and he blesses you. And Lahiri Mahashaya loves you. You are dearly and kindly watched by him. 
I have told you this, breaking the laws of divine secrecy. I mean, he, he says it, but he goes on to say, of course, I knew I could tell you. Now, what's interesting is that as long as Rajasi is alive, Master never lets on that Rajasi would know this. I mean, how could he not know it? He, hadn't, he has had all these experiences of samadhi, but he treats him and Rajasi treats Master. The whole time Rajasi, Rajas, Master's alive, as his little boy. And, you know, Dorga says, there's no way to write about this, that always they never broke that form. Rajasi was always the disciple in Master's presence. Master was always the guru. He said, but then you, she said, but then you would watch them walking side by side like two little children. She said they could be playing with a little plane and then in a moment they would just slip into Samadhi and just be there for eight hours, you know, playing on the ground, just move. But the whole time, and this is another thing, this is so beautiful, when I, I, I'm concerned that I won't find this quote, I wish I could, but I'll, I'll say it to you. When Rajasi did speak a little, and I'm going to read some of it, I mean, spoke about some of what was happening for him after Master died, I mean, of course, he became not only the president, but he became the spiritual director of all his, of SRF. And they, everybody in SRF kept asking him, are you our guru? I mean, it came up all the time. And he always said, our guru is still with us. Yogananda is our guru. We will never have another guru. I mean, as much as he was needed, to step into the role of teacher, which he did. But this is another beautiful thing about him and just this whole relationship. Master just lived with him. Master just lived through him as long as he stayed in that body after Master died. And Rajasi says that. He said when he had his first operation, you know, he had a brain tumor. He said, I died on the table and I was gone for seven days. And Master, the minute I died, just came into my body. And he kept me alive because Master knew he had to live, that the work wasn't solid yet. Uh, and he said, and Master, only now, this was maybe a year later, is giving me permission to share this with you. He said, but uh, Durga said, every time anybody asked him a question, he would say, let me check with Master. And he would get very still and quiet. And he said, every question I ask, no matter what I ask, Master comes to me. Let me just try and fix this so I can quit playing with him. Sorry. It's tugging on me. This won't look as nice, but let's see if it works as well. Better. I won't have to keep playing with it. Um, every question that anybody asked him in those whole three years, he would stop. And he said, I'm always asking Master. I don't, won't do anything. Master is the guru. He will remain the guru. And he comes to him. A large part of Durga's book, if I can't find it here, I will tell you that a large part of Durga's book is asking him every single day after Master died, and particularly after that first surgery, did you have a visit with Master today? Did you have any visions you'll share with me? And, she di and he did. And she writes of them. I mean, they're very, very beautiful. Um, I'm going to see if I can find them. Just give me one minute here because they're worth it, though. I don't know if I will. I wrote... I wrote the word visions on one of these pieces of paper. Man, this is annoying. Just give me one second to see if I can find it because if I can find it, I'll just talk to you in the meantime as I find other things that I mark because it's also lovely. This is from, um, this is uh, something that Rajasi said I think it was so poignant because, again, he said so little to anybody ever. But uh, 
This is, this is that story I was just telling you. Rajasi always tried to stay in the background, avoiding the limelight. So he said to Master, when Master asked him, oh no, you talk. You can do it much better than I. The instant he uttered these words, however, he got up and started addressing the <laughs> gathering. The instant, she said, he realized that he had contradicted his guru. Um, he had shown reluctance when the master asked him to do something. Immediately, he corrected himself. There was not a second of delay. He had a very soft voice, and quietly he said, when he stood up then, I have the Christ consciousness. Nobody has to tell me what it is. I know. I've experienced it. Then he said, when the ego steps out, God steps in. When the ego steps in, God steps out. And you know, I just, I love that. He says, there is not room for both. Because one of Sister Guiana Monta's famous lines, which I also have marked, but I'll just say to you, she says, in some ways, if you want God to take your hand and walk with you, then you have to let go of all of your earthly attachments. If you're holding on to anything else, God can't take your hand. She says it much more beautifully than I just did. You can hear such extraordinary wisdom just coming through both of them. I don't want to waste too much time, but I do, I do want to find some of these visions because he had them, um, and they're so beautiful. And Durga just asked him all the time, see if that's, did anything happen today? Did you? This is just another letter to Master from India. Most beloved little one, I didn't know I would miss anyone as much as I do my little one. He said, tears just flow from my eyes. I wanted a divine friend and I have the most perfect in you. And I cannot help feeling the drama of commingled human love and divine love. Isn't that interesting? Really touched me. Please forgive me for feeling this way. I don't want to add to your suffering. So beautiful. I can't believe that I can't find these visions. Well, let me just say to you, because I want to talk a little bit about Sister, that he had them. Every single day, Durga would ask him. And all of our line of masters appeared to him every day, and he would immediately then share the wisdom that they were bringing to him. I mean, it's interesting, as I just come back to where I started, until Master left, when you hear Durga talk about Rajasi, because she was just such a character, you know, which she was, and this is part of my discussion with Asha yesterday about, I mean, obviously everybody knew this and it was a topic of discussion. She just, she had no censors on herself. Whatever came into her, uh, her mind, she just said it. So she had this kind of, it wasn't a court, of course, you know, she was master's third or fourth highest disciple. She was a, a great soul in and of herself. Her life was truly remarkable. There was nothing this woman couldn't accomplish. This was in the early 1900s. And she was managing to get every single thing that Master and Rajasi needed and get it done and get cars to drive them and trains and get them to airports. And, you know, she had to learn to drive and she had to learn to sew and she had to learn to cook and paint. And I mean, she just was really a God-centered being. It, it's remarkable about her life. So please don't think I'm saying anything else. But she had a mouth on her, this woman, and she would just tell it like it was. So you read the whole first part of her book and you hear her describe him. And you're thinking, I don't get it. I mean, who was he? And in all these years, he's never saying a word for himself. You know? He's just sitting there and going into samadhi, but he's not speaking. And, um, but you feel her love developing for him over the years. Be, oh, and then I wanted to say, here she is, this very high being. And Master says to her, your job is to take care of him. And he wasn't easy. I mean, he had very strict rules, not just about how he dressed, you know, not just like in that way, but 
how his clothes had to be. He had, I mean, I know you've all read this, but in the context of how I'm saying it, I mean, his diet was meticulous and it just had to be, and if it was the least bit off, he just wouldn't touch it. You know, so she could work hard and do many things for him and then, you know, the juice that wasn't perfect or the carrots that weren't exactly the right carrots or brought at the right time. He never complained. He just wouldn't touch it, you know? His clothes were sent back to Kansas City, the early 1900s, so that they could be laundered in the right way. And, you know, he couldn't stand smells. Nobody would come near him until they had really bathed. And they talked about they would scrub themselves because of, of his sense of smell. And he was just clear about it. It wasn't done meanly. It was like, no, this is how I want things. So it wasn't an easy job she was given. And I think early on, it really felt, you know, I think, she, I don't know, it seems like she, I could be misreading this. And I don't want to be trying to analyze one as great as she was. But it feels like it took her a little bit of time to get used to it. Although always she was willing to do it because her guru had asked him. But Rajasi was her whole life just about. As long as he was in the body, he was her whole life making sure every single thing was exactly perfect. But you feel this evolution, how they became disciples of this one great one. And then it was them serving master. And that love is what you felt. At that point, it became easier for me to feel his, and I'm talking about me, not him now, obviously, to feel his saintliness. Really pretty remarkable. He and sister had a beautiful relationship, sister Gyanamata, though um, they didn't have much to do with each other. You know, the monks and the nuns were not around each other all that much in those days either. That was another interesting thing about Durga being the one but I think who would take care of him. But I think, of course, Master knew that Durga could take care of him the way he wanted um, Rajasi to be taken care of. You know that beautiful story where Master comes to Durga one night and said, would you get me a needle and a thread? And he brings it to Master. And she, she brings it to Master, and Master starts show, uh, uh, sewing Rajasi's suspender. And Dorka goes, Master, I can take that and do that. Master said, no, I want to sew it myself. I mean, it was just, it, you know, you, could, you can just feel this extraordinary love. So I think what I want to say to all of you is, there's no way to paraphrase all of this, but I would read this trilogy book again whenever... I mean, it's beautiful, it reads so easily, and it, it, it is like being in love. It's not like being in love, it is being in love. The highest, most extraordinary love that for our sake also was played out in this world. And you can just see, oh, because I feel that at times I was watching Master with Rajasi, not because Rajasi was ever the guru, but I feel like part of the lesson I learned was more about the guru-disciple relationship in this book, almost from how master was with Rajasi. Because Rajasi didn't speak, so I couldn't learn it from him. But you could see the care that one takes of one who was as great as Rajasi, never mind an avatar. You know, Because I think Rajasi in this life attained sub. Uh, Sabikalpa Samadhi, no, Nirvikalpa, I'm sorry. But he didn't, Master never said it. it, nobody ever spoke of him as an avatar. He attained it in this life. So there was obviously a difference. And again, Rajasi made that very clear. He made it really clear to all of SRF, our guru is always Yogananda, which was an amazing gift to give them, to just lift any confusion about that now and forever. It was, and, they, and they all listened to Rajasi. I mean, they knew who he was. But this is a book about divine love. That's what it is. And it's very much worth reading. Um, before I move on to Sister, let me just play you this, because it's, it's fun to just hear Rajasi's 
voice. This is the only recording we have of him, I think. Aganesh, tell me if this works. Sendlin would say a word. That was master. The only time that I ever attempt to say anything is when master called on me to say something. <laughs> and I'm not much of a speaker. Did you hear that? But what I feel, I can tell you. It is a blessing for... Sorry. I turned it off. And I came to Calcutta. No, no, no. And I was telling everybody. St. Lynn would say a word. St. Lynn would say a word. That was Master. The only time that I ever attempt to say anything is when Master called on me to say something. <laughs> and I'm not much of a speaker, but what I feel, I can tell you. It is a blessing for us that Pastor was born on this day because truly he was not born a man but was born to lead the way to those of us who were groping in the dark trying to find our way. I think we should be realistic about life. We're not realistic in the West because we fear life. We don't know what it is, it's all a mystery, and we fear it. And we don't have the courage to face our destiny. And we stumble through, grope through life, through the life here on earth, which we think is life, without knowing what life is. <laughs> and that's why I say we are blessed that Master was born on this day because he has given us the light. I have tried to be realistic about life, and that's why I'm here. I'm not here through any emotion or being carried away by something. I'm here because I found wisdom here in Master. I didn't find it in the West. And what is religion? Where does religion come from? What does it mean to us? What is life? Where did it come from? What does it mean to us? Those questions have occurred in the lives of all of us. And we could not satisfy ourselves. We couldn't find the answer in anything that was ever offered to me here, anyway, until I met Master. I was skeptical, as everyone was. I wanted to know, and I had to be shown, because I'm from Missouri, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so Master did show me, not something outside of myself, he did the showing to me in myself. And he brought me to self-realization. I wonder if you've ever pondered the real meaning to you of self-realization. What does it mean to you? Ponder it. It's your life. It's God manifest in you. And we, we think of our scriptures. We like to rely upon our own scriptures. But did you ever understand the scriptures until you had some wisdom was brought to you by one who can bring the experience of those who wrote the scriptures? No, you didn't understand them. I didn't, I know. And that's why I say I was groping. And that's why I didn't accept anything in religion until I met Master. I couldn't accept anything in religion because I was asked to believe something. And I couldn't believe something that I couldn't experience. And the blessing that we enjoy here through Master is the blessing that the disciples of Jesus enjoyed through him. There's not one bit of difference. None whatever. There's just one God one life, 
and one wisdom, one truth, that's the truth of God. And Jesus brought that truth to his disciples and those who followed him because he was the man of God consciousness as our master is and the masters of our master. And that consciousness is what you are seeking. And if you don't have it, you will never, never be satisfied. There's a spark in you that will drive you, it will drive you sometime to realization of that life in you. You can't avoid it. It's your nature. It's there. And you'll have to find it. And if you don't find it in this incarnation, you'll come back here or you'll go somewhere or you'll be somewhere that you will have to find it. And what a blessing it is that we here in the West who enjoy the greatest comforts of material wealth, of material being, to have come to us in our midst one with the greatest wisdom, the greatest wealth of all, who brings to us God. He said, where is that? Where can we want to find that? That is the first um, talk, a little five-minute talk on this, the glory of the Spirit. Yeah. And I don't know of any other place. Yeah, but it's just, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, I mean, there's something about just letting that vibration in. You know, once you realize who, who he is, really. I, I, and I just, uh, it seems to me that the most important aspect of his life for us is because I, I kept thinking, well, what's the bottom line here? He, he's a great soul. He came. He lived with Master. I mean, there's a lot about that that's exciting and wonderful to read. But for me, it really, I feel like I just learned more about love. I mean, that's all I can say because it was so unconditional and so simply played out. You know, just absolutely so simply walking on the beach, playing with toys. You know, the story of the water gun. He was shooting it up and having a drip on Rajasi's head and Rajasi didn't, you know, just those kind of, Master could really play with him. I mean, you read these books, you go through every Christmas together and really feel when the love of God is around, how it can just break your heart to be separated from it, which is what Master was saying. And Master literally wrote that to Rajasi. So it was just very touching really deeply touching. Um, let's see. I'm going to just see so I can see what time it is to see where we go with sister. Does anybody need to stand up and take a little break? Okay. Let's, let's take a five-minute break. On February 27th, when I asked Rajas the, if he had seen Master lately, isn't that funny? She says, this is Durga. No, Master has gone somewhere doing something. I haven't lost contact with him but he's very busy, he said. The other masters come, though, um, and uh, he's telling him that he's in that world, masters as busy as he was here. And then he said, he looked at me, and okay, he looked at me and he answered, I was getting the answer about the boy going out to lecture. It came direct from Sri Yukteswarji, and he said to me, I don't want those who have personal ambitions or who want to go out looking for flattery, um, who have selfish aims, um, nor have selfish aims. He's saying, who can go out teaching? Because I found the quote, now I'm going to lose it again, but where Rajasi was saying, not just about questions about people when people come and ask him questions, but particularly questions about SRF and what direction it was supposed to take or some organizational issue that he said, I always ask Master, and Master always answers me. So this is Sri Yukteswar who's telling him, I only want those to go out and give these teachings who are unselfish and who love God only and have some realization. None but these should go out and teach. That's interesting. Then all the Masters came, 
and Master was in the center of them. This is one of them. Um, and then Rajasi said, Master was very much with me today and he told me, I too felt the sting of leaving. I did not want to leave you all. I had no attachment to anything or anyone, but I did not want to cause you all so much sorrow by my leaving. This ends a full year without me. This is March 7th, 1953. This ends a full year without me. It will be easier to bear from now on. And then just one more I'll read, because you can all read these, but you can see. I tell you, I cannot feel my body at all. It is Master who is walking. It is just like he is in my body, and I personally don't exist. When I'm walking, I feel Master's body swaying in mine. I feel his muscles in my muscles. I feel his head in my head. It is not I who is walking now, uh, but Master. This morning I awakened by singing and the masters were dancing around me. I could not understand why this celebration when the thought came to me, oh, today is my birthday. And the masters were singing and dancing around in celebration. I mean, every day of his life, they just came to him and lived with him. It's just so sweet. It really made me, it gave me added incentive to get there, you know. I mean, to just live in such love. Okay, let's just move over to Sister for a few minutes uh, for whatever time we have left now. Um, I think, again, all of you know her beginning story. She was a seeker. She really just never found the right thing. But she had this beautiful realization early on, and that is, until I find my guru, I'm going to let life be my guru. Everything that happens to me I will assume is happening to me as if my guru and my teacher were here making it happen, which I just thought was such a lovely way of thinking about life, like opening to it and holding it as a teaching. Uh, as you all know, from the first night that she saw Master, well, actually, it was sort of funny. I mean, she was very drawn to Master, <clears throat> and she wouldn't go and see him because she was very concerned about her husband's position in the law school. So she sent her son, who came back totally transformed, but who had been sworn to secrecy with the teaching, so he couldn't share anything with her. And she, she was, of course, precious about it. She was such a love. This woman was just such a love. She said, she said, you know, I always felt that I wanted to have a partner. I always felt like I wanted to know human love. She said, but I was never even for a moment interested in anything until I saw, and she says her husband's first name, I forget what it was, but until I saw him. She was 30 years old when she met him and she married him. And she was so deeply devoted to him as he was to her. I mean, you all know the beautiful story. He went down to uh, uh, Encinitas or Mount Washington with her one time. And he said to, her, to Master, I just want to know that you'll let her come and live here, that she'll be welcome when I leave. He said, I see she feels more at home here now than she does at home. And it was clearly her role to stay with him as long as he was in a human body. When he died, she wrote Master a letter and um, <clears throat> asking if she could come now. And she didn't hear back from him from a very long time, for a very long time. Apparently the mail got delayed, something happened, but she had to live with that sense that the answer was no. And, you know, she lived with it. I mean, as sister would. But then finally that the letter came saying, of course, I've been waiting for you. You know, I knew that you would be coming. And she went and I, you know, I had to try and find a way to speak a little bit about her because, um, we all know so much about her and we've heard so much about her. But what an extraordinary soul, even in the few letters that I read in the back of her book uh, about Rajasi, so letters that went back and forth. She just was so filled with humility that although Master says loud, you know, clearly, sister is my most highly evolved female disciple, and Rajasi is my most highly evolved male disciple. And he speaks about it in one of these books a little bit. So, I mean, you just know who she is. Um, 
but, and he said she would be free, free in this life. I mean, so again, it's so highly evolved, but she always treated Rajasi like he was the guru that, I mean, master was her guru, but she treated him with such respect. Maybe I should say it that way. And always, you know, she went to him and she would ask him many questions and she would also um, write him letters that just said, I just am so grateful that you would even think of spending this much time with me, being as unworthy of your time as I am. That's just how she held him. I mean, there was nothing about her that took up any space. And Master said she did not gain, acquire any new karma in this life. He said she lived um, through the yamas and niyamas perfectly. He said she was the exact perfect um, embodiment of ahimsa. So she made no new karma. And you just feel that in her. She had no need other than to love her guru perfectly. And, you know, when I looked at this book, her book, God Alone, of course, we've all been through much of it at least many times, but I looked at it in a different way tonight, and I really got these categories of her chapters. I mean, it sounds silly to say that because we've assigned these readings, we've talked about them like that, but somehow I felt them so deeply as all of what she came to teach us by living that. I mean, the embodiment of what perfect devotion looks like, the manifestation of what the perfect guru-disciple relationship was. And as many times as I've read these letters, um, I just want to say to everybody, you know, read them again and again and again. Each letter, there's no way to paraphrase any of this. This is why Darmini was saying, this is such a hard class to prepare for. It's actually an impossible class to prepare for unless we just sat down and we read each other these letters because every letter is like the voice of God speaking to you and you can't let any part of it go. Having said that, and since I was on and I had to find some way to try and do this, I tried to figure out what are, you know, how would I categorize um, what the things she was saying. I mean, there are those sayings of hers that are more um, well-known to us. But so right attitude was, of course, it's the biggest part of her book. And uh, in, in one of her beautiful letters, again, not to be paraphrase, they're impossible. She said, if I were to give you the gift that I would like best of all to offer you, it would be the gift of right attitude towards God and guru, toward life, toward your work, toward the others of your group. But the best gifts cannot be purchased and given. The gifts and graces of the soul must be acquired by patient daily practice. All will surely be yours in time, for if you do not obtain them in the position to which God has called you, where in the world are they to be found? Isn't that just so beautiful? So she says, you know, the gift of right attitude needs to be culti cultivated. It's a state of mind. It's a practice. It's not anything that you can acquire other than going within and working with it from the inside out. But then she goes on to say, make no mistake about it. Your life, exactly as it is, is the perfect um, grist for your mill. It is the perfect grist. And she says it so beautifully. For if, if you do not obtain them in the position to which God has called you, where in the world are they to be found? It's just such a beautiful way of saying it and a reminder for all of us. I mean, we say this over and over, but forgive me, you know, the lessons on the spiritual path are really, we have to repeat them. It's not like we ever hear in a Sunday service or in a class, do we ever hear anything we've never heard before? We hear it in as many different ways as who's ever speaking can think to present it to us, hoping that with each little time, 
we're going to get it again and again. Or we read Sister's book again and again. But to really leave here tonight, if nothing else, saying to ourselves, there is not a mistake that can happen in our life. Everything that comes to us is so that we can develop right attitude. Everything. And it doesn't matter how beautiful it is, how perfect we think it is, how hard it is, how much we want to kick out and scream and fight against it. You just stop and you say to yourself, ah, this is mine. This is what's coming to me right now because where else in the world would I find it except in that which we ourselves are magnetizing? And that's what she says. And she goes on to say, in all of these letters, in this whole section on right attitude. Basically, she says, right attitude will lead to happiness. Right, cultivate inner attitude to maintain inner happiness and peace in all circumstances. And you just get then, of course, it's so simple. How could you not be at peace if you have the right attitude? If you say, oh, look at what, look at what I get to deal with right now. That's a total peace. You know, the other day I texted Caitlin, do you mind if I tell this story? It's so beautiful. I texted her because, you know, I was just looking at her. Whatever came to me later, I texted her, you okay? She texts me back always. And, you know, <laughs> it really made me giggle because I thought there is no other answer. Because she didn't say to me, oh, everything's great. It was sort of like, yeah, I was probably seeing what I was seeing. But when I say to her, you okay? She said always. It was so beautiful. It really touched me. Yep, no matter what's going on, of course I'm always okay. What else? When we see each other, not long after I moved into the community, I quit saying to people when I saw them, hey, how are you? What's anybody going to answer on this path? You know, you don't say I'm miserable, I hate life, things are terrible. You say, fine. And you don't even just say fine, you say, great, I'm great. Look at where I am in life, look at what it's giving me. That's what Sister's saying. She said, developing the right attitude towards life is at the very foundation of the spiritual path and in life in general. And it's the key to obtaining emotional and spiritual maturity, which I really think it is. I mean, I'm not going to have the exact quote right now, and I don't know if Ram Dass or anybody else will, but in uh, Education for Life, when Swamiji says, oh no, he defines maturity as the ability to consider somebody else's um, experience, not just your own. Sorry, I had that wrong. But sister says spiritual maturity. And this she says too, this is very interesting. She said, right attitude makes your personal magnetism very strong. I love that. I mean, just all of the ways that she talks about it through, through all of these letters. So she talks about, I just highlight these subjects and hope that you can use them moving forward when you pick up this book. Um, th there's other points that she makes in all of these letters of right attitude, but those are the main ones. And that one letter that I read to you at the beginning really says it all. It's just so beautiful how she brings it together. The guru-disciple relationship, which she says really is about, and she writes this, I just sat right before class, I read every letter in the Guru Disciple chapter again, and I thought, there's no way to share these, but to, these should be bedtime stories that we read to each other. That's what, it, that's what it should be. Like you go home and you find a friend or your partner, and you just read any one of these stories. But really for her, it's about how can I please you, Master? What, how can I please you now and now and now? And you know, the reason that her life is so rich for us is because if Master said it to her, it's true for all of us. So we're not just reading what Sister Gianna Mata says. If in every circumstance in our life, we just imagine that we're holding hands with Master and we say, I am right with you. How can I please you now? What would you like me to do in this situation? One of the things that I wanted to read to you that I didn't, one of these yellow or purple tags, was, let me just think if I can come up with the question that somebody, oh, somebody asked Rajasi 
well, why doesn't Master come to all of us, you know, the way he comes to you? Because every day he was just coming to him and Master was sort of like, hold on, let me ask Master. And he would go over here and ask Master and come back and report. And somebody was saying, why doesn't he come to us? And Master just said, basically, don't let them forget. I'm not coming to them. They have to come up to me. And he literally said, up to me. So, I mean, I think when we read these letters about the guru-disciple relationship, every one of them is teaching us how do we, how do we approach the master? You know, I, I know when I gave this talk this last Sunday and I was talking about prayer, something came to me that I wrote down immediately and I said it, but I didn't underline it, but it's perfect here. Because one of the purposes of prayer is to allow us to draw near to the master. It's not to draw the master to us. And that came to me when I was thinking about prayer on Saturday night, and I knew it to be true. You know, when I got that sentence that way. So I really wanted to make sure when I was talking about, I mean, no, but I wouldn't expect anybody to remember this, and I probably didn't do a great job of it, but at some point there were four points that I was making about prayer. I didn't make them like that. I didn't say here are four points, but there were four things I wanted to mention. But one of them is that prayer is an opportunity for us to draw near to God, not to draw God to us. And then today I was reading that when Master was saying, oh, they want to see me. They have to come to me. And I thought, of course we do. You know, and it's a mistake. So here were all these really great monks and nuns saying, why isn't Master coming to us? Then she talks about renunciation so beautifully as inner renunciation, which is really our path. I mean, of course it is, because it's how Swamiji brought it here. But we're not people who are denying the world. We're people who have an inner, we can have things that people all over and on to own things. We own houses, we own cars, we own, you know, a lot of nice, beautiful clothing and uh, it just it goes on and on. That's not the point. The point is about this inner renunciation and non-attachment, which she speaks with beautifully. I'm just going to spend a couple more minutes highlighting some of these just to hear one of sisters, uh, the other, because these are threads that go through all of these letters. Otherwise, you just read a letter after a letter, and but you say, well, what are all of the, what are the spiritual lessons she's trying to give us? You know, one of the things that Sister always said that's in all of this that I love is more and better. You know, in a cute way, she said it when she was scolding that one nun. Whenever Master calls me, you say yes and make it snappy. That was one thing about how can I serve you, Master. That was about the guru-disciple relationship. But in terms of her own spiritual growth, always more and better. What else can I do today? How can I be a better uh, disciple? And she goes on to say, remember, uh, no one, not even a master, can do everything for you. You have to do it for yourself. And that's when she talks about that uh, more and better. And she also, um, I don't want to just keep, I'm going to just say two things. The other the other quote of hers that we all know, but I just couldn't end tonight without saying it because uh, this again, well, this is right attitude definitely, but said so perfectly in one of her little phrases when she says, I was kneeling in prayer in the chapel. This is in one of her letters, how it is. I was thinking of something that was coming into my life that filled me with apprehension. I knew it was not the will of God that I should be saved from this experience. Even at that moment, it was moving toward me. Suddenly, God told me the prayer he would listen to, and I said it quickly, and that's where she said, change no circumstance of my life, change me. But isn't that beautiful? I mean, within the context of the letter, suddenly God told me the prayer he would listen to, and I said it quickly. And what, what a beautiful, beautiful thing because, you know, God knows what we need long before we do. 
He knows before we speak. I mean, that was another thing that came to me about prayer. The minute we decide to pray, we get his help because that presence, that, con- that super consciousness knows what we need long before we utter the words of prayer. So as soon as we're willing, as soon as we move in that direction, as soon as God can work with us, oh, I gotta pray for this, that's it. You don't even have to say the words. You know, you walk toward your altar. And I mean, really, it is the truth. It's just, <laughs> this is what I said. I, I just realized it's all, because it's the, it's the basic spiritual principles. On Sunday when I said, people always want to ask her, my friend who was saying to me, but I can't meditate. And you guys always speak like the answer to everything is meditation. There's, there's a dilemma here. How can I keep coming? I can't sit to meditate. I said, if you walk by your altar and you pronom, because she was saying, I'm too restless, I can't sit still. I said, don't sit still. Just hold your hands here. Walk by God. Everything starts changing you. And it's the truth. It sounds like you're just making up an answer, but you're not. People want something else that's harder or different. I don't know. But say, no, please just do that. Okay, I'm going to finish with this. These are four highlights that... Either I came up with them or or Dharmini did. I'm not sure, but I'll just share them with you. See nothing, look at nothing but your goal ever shining before you. She's saying, of course, bring as much attention and energy and focus as you can to really wanting God. The things that happen to us do not matter. What we become through them does. And that's another one of her such wisdom. The things that happen to us don't matter, but what we become through them. It's all about right attitude, but there you have it. Each day, accept everything is coming to you from God. At night, give everything back into his hands. We incarnate here on this plane in order to learn certain lessons. Gain necessity, I'm having trouble reading now. At night, give everything back into his hands. We incarnate here on this plane in order to learn certain lessons, gain necessary experience, do work we are fitted to do. We take up our appointed positions and we cannot have what belongs to another. We get our own, neither more nor less. It is only by cooperating with our karma that we find the path of peace and blessedness. Yeah, so I will end with that. What else is there to say? Thank you all. Sorry, I ran a little over here. <laughs>